five minutes if we get the yeah, so yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start to uh, uh, bring us into tonight uh, to our Ratnakuta Sutra, uh, our Pika Jewels Sutra number 32, part three. That's right, folks. This is our Ashoka Data Sutta Sutra. Um, this is part three, so I'm not going to spend too much time bringing us back up to speed. In that way, I, I, I need to reintroduce sort of where we're at in the discourse. Um, so I'm going to do that. Uh, I got a lot of big plans for tonight. Um, I've got some, well, just, yeah, a lot of good stuff to, to try to, to do. I'm going to try to do it in a mellow way, even though it's sort of, you know, we're going to have some great signless examples again. Love the signless examples. We're going to get into that. Um, we're going to meet a few more monks tonight, uh, in addition to the monks that have been, you know, that we've been talking about. I'm hoping later on that we're going to get into some really in, uh, serious exegesis tonight. Yeah, so if you've never ever done any serious exegesis, any serious textual study, well, get ready. So tonight's the night on that. Uh, and then I'm hoping if all things go according to plan, we're going to start to dismantle the patriarchy. So, you know, we're, we'll, we'll, I don't want to get too like, hopeful, but that's, that's, the, that's our plan. So, uh, Ashoka Data, um, tonight, it's the gift of fearlessness. So I've sort of been switching this up each night. The name of our he hero, heroine, Bodhisattva here, uh, is Ashoka Data. And this Sanskrit of fearlessness and giving, Ashoka and Datta, that's what we've been playing with. Um, the first night, I believe it was the uh, fearless virtue, sort of the virtue of fearlessness. Last time it was born of fearlessness, sort of fearless born. Uh, and tonight it's the gift of fearlessness. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, the sutra takes place in Rajgriha, right? This is the capital of Magadha. The Buddha is on Mount, uh, the vulture's peak, Gridrakuta. Yeah. Um, and of course, what's funny about this sutra is it's one of those beautiful um, uh, Mahayana sutras where it starts off with the Buddha, but then quickly the, the action shifts to this other situation, which is that these 10 uh, monks, elder senior monks get up one morning and they go to King Ajatashatru's house and they are begging for food. And the interesting thing that sparks this sutra off is that King Ajatashatru has this daughter, a 12-year-old daughter named Ashoka Datta. And when the elder senior monks come over to the house begging for food, the king stands up, the queen stands up, all the servants stand up, everybody stands up to greet and honor the Shravakas, the monks, except for Ashoka Datta. She refuses to stand up. And the discourse or the sutra in a way begins with her father, Ajatasatru, saying, stand up, stand up. What, what, what's gotten into you? And Ashoka Datta proceeds to explain, <laughs> you know, politely to her father that she's made a bodhisattva vow. She's made a vow to save all sentient beings. She hasn't made some tiny vow to achieve liberation for oneself. She's made a vow to liberate all sentient beings. And so on that uh, kind of moral footing, if you will, she says, I will not stand to these monks. Um, this was all given in a, you know, long discourse and even in a poem and a long song. Um, and everyone actually, even the monks, were in a way sort of impressed. They were sort of like, wow, uh, 
Shokodata, wow. And so we begin this question and answer, right? This format of, of these kind of types of Buddha sutras in which it's this Q and A and it begins with Shariputra. Um, and just really quickly, just to remind you that conversation between the, this, um, you know, Shariputra, the, the, he's like king debater. He knows he's king logician. And so he steps up to make sure she knows what she's talking about. And so they have this beautiful exchange all regarding the signless. And if you remember on that first night, I kind of gave us this kind of interesting example of a vault full of books. But then when we got to looking at all of those different books and started categorizing them in different ways into journals and ledgers and catalogs and magazines, because we started creating all of these other criteria, we quickly sort of realized, oh, we didn't have any books to begin with. We sort of revealed their empty nature by this kind of uh, reassignment game. And then even did something more interesting, which was took all the individual books and just put them in one concept of a library. Sort of took away their individuality and added them to a single concept, much in the same way that a book itself is a collection of words. <laughs> Right. And so there's this sort of idea that gets exchanged between the two of them sort of back and forth. Um, again, all of these are are considered the eldest, wisest of of the Buddha's disciples. So for this, you know, back and forth to be going and 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 for uh, Shokodatta be, to be delivering such discourse, you know, is it's really something. Right. That exchange, uh, and, and, and Shariputra is, is, is convinced, you know, he's like, wow, you really know what you're talking about. So then he passes the mic, as it were, to Madhulyayana, the, the, the sort of, uh, the, he's, he's known for having the superpowers. He's known for being able to basically see, write, you know, read people's minds. And you could imagine this guy sitting there trying to read this young girl's mind, trying to penetrate her aura, trying to understand her, and he's having a hard time doing it. And so this was where last week, where in order to demonstrate to Madhulyayana that uh, 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 this idea of power or siddhi, right, Ashokadatta, well, she basically uh, manifested a Buddha land. And there was this interesting line, actually, that when that happened, everybody could see this land of the fragrant elephant, the Gandahastin. And there's this beautiful line that everybody could see that Buddha sitting behind a silken net. And he was there teaching the Dharma to all his bodhisattvas and the others surrounding him. That was kind of a mystical moment there that like through a veil, right? Uh, through a glass darkly kind of language that through this silken net, she shows everyone this other world, this fragrant elephant. And this is, this is quite a moment, of course, in terms of the demonstration of achievement, the demonstration of accomplishments. That's the idea of a siddhi. And so everybody is quite uh, astonished including Kashyapya. Uh, this is our third monk. This happened last week where Kashyapya is like, wow, he basically had a vision, a vision of Gandahastin, the fragrant elephant land, right? And so he turns to Ashoka Datta and says, did you see that? Did you see through the veil? Did you see through the silken net? Did you see that Tathagata? And of course, Ashoka Datta proceeds to lay into Kashyapya about all, you know, the, 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 the wrong view of trying to see the Tathagata, of trying to see the Buddha, any Buddha, uh, with the eyes. And this is where she goes off, uh, essentially quoting from the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, that the Tathagata cannot be seen by sight or sought by words, sought by sound in that way. 
And then we spent last time talking about the, not just the physical eyes by which we perceive the world, but these Buddhist five eyes that Buddhist practitioners are in, in the business of developing or opening up, not just the physical eye, but the divine eye, eye of wisdom, Dharma eye, and then a, and a Buddha eye. Right. So these eyes were the focus of last time. And that basically brings us up to speed. Again, if, if, if any of that was too quick for you, go back and watch part two. But that was just to remind you that that's what was happening, is that these monks were stepping up to Ashoka Dutta one by one and kind of trying to test her, test her logic and reason, test her magical powers, um, sort of test her understanding. Kashapya is an interesting character when it comes to uh, knowledge and this sort of um, direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission idea. And then that brings us to, uh, if you're reading along in, in the translation here, um, beginning on page 126. And I think that's everything that I wanted to say. Looking good. Up, next up is Shibuti. So Shibuti is an interesting character, an interesting monk to step up now because I just mentioned that Ashoka Dutta had just, just now, just seconds ago in, in the text, quoted twice from the Vajra Sutra, right, from the Diamond Sutra. She just sort of basically recited two sections of the Vajra Sutra. Well, Shibuti is the star of the Vajra Sutra. Shibuti is sort of like a very heavy hitter when it comes to this idea of emptiness, when it's the signless, all of these very, very subtle ideas that we've been sort of playing with in this text, Shibuti sort of is like the, the heaviest hitter of those ideas. And so when this Dharma, when this doctrine was spoken, by Ashoka Dutta. So all of these amazing things to Shariputra, Maguyana, Kateshapya, when all of this was spoken, Venerable Shibuti was overjoyed and said to Ashoka Dutta, you must have attained great insight to achieve and to have such eloquence. Ashoka Dutta said to the Venerable Shibuti, Shibuti, are there such distinctions as attainable and unattainable among dharmas, among truths? Or is there anything that can possibly be sought to be obtained? What, what causes you to tell me that I have well achieved such eloquence? Because in my opinion, I have eloquence because I perceive nothing, internal or external. Shibuti at once asked the maiden, what realization, what dharma enables you to have such ready, wonderful eloquence? So I'm going to pause there about this idea of ready eloquence, okay? It's sort of at the heart of the Shibuti Ashoka Dutta exchange here that I'm about to abbreviate. You know, eloquence is interesting. I mean, eloquence is what she's been doing. She has been, um, she's been teaching the Dharma, but the idea is, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ideas here, of course, but the idea is, is that she's been teaching the Dharma freestyle. She's been teaching the Dharma off the dome piece. This was not a prepared Dharma speech. She was just relaxing at home. When these monks showed up and started, you know, getting all up in her grill. And so she, on the spot, was able to rat, rat, ta, 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 ta. And so the idea of the eloquence actually is this, this um, 
you know, I don't want to put too many neologisms like flow state. I don't want to put too, too many new ideas on it, but it is an idea of unhindered eloquence. Uh, the Buddhists speak of it. It does sound like a type of ecstatic state of uh, free verse, kind of ecstatic poetry type of thing. I want you to know the next sutra, <laughs> the next sutra in the collection, sutra number 33 in the Ratnakuta, is called the Discourse of Bodhisattva Ready Eloquence. <laughs> so there's a way in which the whole collection here is starting to set you up for the next sutra to get you excited about the next one in that way. So I just wanted you to know that there's a, like a lot going on with this idea of eloquence. Shibuti is wondering like, wow, like what, are, like what, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what are you eating? What are, type of meditation are you doing? What have you attained that has, has, has given you such eloquence? And of course in, 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 you know, true fashion, uh, Shokadatta says, I haven't, I haven't attained anything. That's why I have such eloquence. I'm not attached to anything. That's why I have such eloquence, right? Now, this conversation, like all the other conversations, it, it gets very tricky. And I would love to spend hours going through it word by word with you. But I, I have a section that I do want to go through word by word later. So I'm going to just skip real quick. There's a little back and forth with Shibuti about this idea of eloquence and, and like, well, Ashoka Dots is trying to make this claim. There's no, there's no, I, there's no, no, that's why. That's why I have a, such eloquence. And so it, it results in this moment where in their back and forth. They're going back and forth and Shibuti's like, wow, wow, like, wow. And then Shibuti says, Shibuti asks in return, now, this ve these very questions of yours, the, the, these very questions of yours, is it because you have acquired eloquence that you are able to raise them or because you have not acquired eloquence? <laughs> So he's like, so I don't get it. So you tell me you haven't acquired anything. And so you're able, like, what's going on here? How is this working? And so Ashoka Datta says, she asks the Venerable Shibuti, Venerable Shibuti, do you believe that all dharmas, all phenomena, all things are like echoes, as the Buddha says? in all those great sutras, <laughs> right? Shibuti replied, I believe it. I believe that all dharmas are like echoes. Ashokadatta asked, does an echo have eloquence or not? Shibuti replied, it is because there is a sound in the valley that an echo is heard outside. Ashoka Dakta said, Shibuti, because there is a sound, there is an echo. Does an echo have any entity or form? It has neither. Why? Because that which arises from, from causes and conditions does not truly arise. Shibuti says, oh, no, 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 all things, all phenomena, all dharmas arise from causes and conditions. Ashoka Datta says, no dharma arises in substance or by nature. So that's all we're going to do with Shibuti. I'm going to start a nice... Uh, echo of what was just said. Um, this is going to be sort of tonight's fun part. This is going to be the fun part of tonight, right? 
is this idea of the echo. So the first, the first lesson was the vault of books <laughs> in which conceptually these books are, right? I sort of tried to, you know, play with the concepts there. Last week, I showed you this thing. And we talked about its color, its shape, its number, its size. We didn't even really start to talk about that. It's, it's like what it, what it does or what it is. Like we didn't even really get to that, right? So tonight, I'm, I'm gonna, we're, we're in the valley. We're in the valley of Rajgriha here. And this is Bodhisattva Maitreya on the top of Mount Gridakruta, right? The peak, of, or the, the peak of vultures there with the Buddha. And he's got his uh, lute, his kind of guitar cello lute instrument, right? And so what the discourse was right now between Ashokadatta and Shibuti was about this idea of the nature of an echo. And so we're gonna talk about echoes for a minute because Ashokadatta is saying that the nature of all phenomena It, the nature of all phenomena is like an echo. Not the nature of all sound, by the way. Not that just, not that this is an echo, the sound, but that all phenomena, be it visual, tactile, olfactory, you name it, are like echoes. So what, how, what would the Buddha have meant by that? Well, I... I want to read to you quickly. So this is me, you know, whoop, whoop, we're going to just mix in a different sutra here real quick. This is uh, the Samdhinya Mochana Sutra, uh, kind of a very profound sutra of the Yogacara tradition. Maitreya, Maitreya is sort of a star of this sutra, this future Buddha. And in this sutra, I, it, it was just, it's just one that for me always comes to mind. And so I would just want to read to you uh, from it really quickly. This is the Buddha. This is the Buddha speaking. And they're speaking about this idea of, well, the idea that Ashokadatta and Subhuti are talking about. And the Buddha says that it is like the fresh white color of a conch shell. For it is not easily ascertained whether that color is identical with or different from the shell. Or consider the melodies from the sound of a guitar. For it is difficult to ascertain whether that sound is identical with or different from the guitar. Or take the fragrance that wells up from aloes. For it is difficult to tell whether it is, di whether it is identical with or different from the aloes. Or take the bitter taste of pepper. For it is difficult to tell if it is identical with or different from pepper. So the Buddha uses those analogies in that sutra to unpack a bunch of really interesting ideas. I just wanted to use those words rather than mine um, because they're beautiful. It's more like an echo. And because of this idea that, that's presented in there, which is what is, the, what is the relationship between the sound? So here's Shibuti and he has heard the sound of Maitreya's guitar, right? Is the sound of the guitar, is the note that Shibuti hears, is it the same as the guitar or is it different than the guitar? The thing about it is, is that if they're the same, if, if the note heard by Shibuti, if it is the same as the guitar, in essence, right? Well, my, Maitreya's got a very big guitar. Huge, right? Because the guitar doesn't just end here. You're telling me 
Shibuti, that the guitar is wherever the sound of it can be heard. Is that what you're telling me, Shibuti, that the guitar and the sound of the guitar are one? They're, they're the same, right? And if you're thinking, well, okay, well, yeah, that's a, that would make it a very big guitar. That you're right. That 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 would mean that the guitar and the and the sound of the guitar are separate. Is that what you just? Is that what you just you you want to go with that shibuti? Because then guess what? Guess what? Here's a guitar. This doesn't make sound either. Just like the guitar, just like the guitar you told me about, that is separate from the sound of it. So guitars and sounds, those are two different things. So this isn't making any noise either. My glasses aren't making any noise either. Does that mean they're a guitar? What is a guitar then, if it's not the sound that it makes? Right? It's a very, very kind of like interesting idea. Put put that uh, just just hold on to that, right? I, I got my Treya, I got my Treya up here. He's not going anywhere. So just hold on to that one, right? Because now, oh, that's right. Now we're gonna have some fun. Now we're gonna have some fun because I have here a record. I, not only do I have a record, I have a forty-five record. I got the the Menahan Street Band. I got the Menahan Street Band doing Make the Road by Walking. And what's funny about the Menahan Street Band doing a song called Make the Road by Walking, of course, is that Make the Road by Walking is a quote from an ancient Chinese poem, the Chuangzi, that says a, a road, a road only comes into existence by walking it. That's what makes a road, is one walking it, right? So there's roads everywhere, right? You make the road by walking. It's a really, I mean, it's, it's awesome, right? So, man, I sure would love to hear the Menahan Street Band make the road by walking, sampled by Jay-Z, right? Sampled by Jay-Z in uh, Rock Boys, and the winner is, Right, so I would really like to hear "Make the Road by <laughs> Make the Road by Walking." Right, but I um, so I'm gonna need one of these. Right, one of these tiny little needles. You know these, right? The record needle. Um, technically, I think the stylus. Right, so. I'm gonna use my, my wonderful 45 record and this stylus, this needle, to talk about some really interesting Buddhist ideas <laughs> regarding sense bases, sense objects, consciousness, dependent origination, and all of that. Because again, I sure would like to listen to my 45. And the, I'll tell you what, <laughs> The guy at the record shop, he, he told me that it, he told me it was on there. <laughs> he 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 swore to me, I, he swore to me that it was on there. So I'm sitting there thinking, like you know, so because I don't have all night to to make you smile. <laughs> the idea here is, of course, is that I need this. I need the needle in order to hear what's on the record, right? Because there's this funny thing that happens that when the needle comes into contact with the object, there's a like a, almost a Vedana, like a frictional sensation that happens, that vibration, where the sound emerges. <gasps> Whoa, the sound emerges from them coming into contact. Wow. So, Oh, so then forget this because this you just told me the sound the sound comes out of here. God, okay. I, I don't hear anything. I don't hear it. You told me the sound came out of here. I don't get it. I don't get it. Where where's the music? Where's the music, right? Well, 
again, I don't have all night, but the idea here, of course, is that this is a sense object. This could be your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, or your body, or your mind, actually. And when one comes into contact with the other, there emerges the phenomena of sound, sense, taste, touch. And the idea is, is that as soon as you remove the contact, poof, the music's gone. And, it, and it's not here, and, or is it here? Now, this could get fun, of course, because actually with the needle, you need the cartridge and an amplifier. And you could take this analogy pretty far in terms of sense objects, sense organs, and then the mind as a kind of amplifier, but it's only amplifying what's being presented by the sense organs. But the sense organs are only really, you know, relating to the sense objects. So there's a whole big analogy that I could be doing there, but it's not what I, why I brought you here. It's not what we're here to do. If you kind of are thinking about that idea that the sound is not in the record or the needle, but arises upon the contact between the two, and therefore the sound is not owned, held, or possessed by either the record or the needle. It is not a proper, it's not held by either of those, right? Well, Ashoka Dutta is kind of saying that about this idea of all phenomena not being held or possessed or owned by the thing that you think it's being held and possessed by. It's all dependently originated phenomena. And so if I can, so now Maitreya is up there and he's, he's playing Make the Road by Walking by the Menahan Street Band. And it's echoing through the valley of Rajgriha, right? Here's, because here's a, a, another layer, another interesting layer. The sound, the sound of Maitreya's guitar emanates from the guitar. And there's an interesting, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, which is, is the sound the guitar or is it different than the guitar are they identical or are they different right that was the original conundrum are they separated and if you lean if you lean towards the idea that no 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 the guitar the guitar is making the sound so like there it, it there here's the thing about an echo an echo is being made by the side of the walls of the canyon. It is literally being made by that because the original sound, the, the original sound, according to you, Shibuti, the original sound was made by the guitar because that's from whence it emanated. Well, an echo actually hits the side of the mountain and reverberates off of it is an echo is made by the mountain. An echo is not made by the guitar. An echo is made by the mountain. And so now, Shibuti, are you telling me the guitar that Maitreya's guitar is the entire earth, the entire cosmos? Is that what you're telling me? Well, it's a, it's a necessary consequence of your reasoning, Shibuti. <laughs> if, 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 the, if these things are linked the way you think they are, right? Okay, that's my fun dependent origination example for tonight. Are we, are we good? We having fun? Yay. Okay. Because I do, I want to get to the good stuff. That, that was our, 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 our delayed Tathagata shot in a way, right? That was just to get, now we're, now we're in it. We're like, oh my gosh, it, Michael's an echo. <laughs> Where? I, okay, I, I can't get back into the echoes. I can't get back into the echoes. But what happens is, is this. After this beautiful exchange and this discourse about eloquence and all of that, 
Ashoka Dutta drops on Shibuti this. This is her, this is her sort of like, you know, her little topper there. She says, Shibuti, a bodhisattva's eloquence has nothing to do with acquisition or non-acquisition. Learning or not learning. Renouncing the household life or not renouncing the household life. And why? Because a bodhisattva's wisdom comes from purity of mind and along with wisdom, eloquence appears. Okay. Um, that's the, I'm going to end the Shibuti section there. They do have a little bit of more of an exchange. I want you to just, um, it's actually sort of a deeper aspect of their exchange, which is this idea that because a, a bodhisattva's eloquence has nothing to do with acquisition or non-acquisition. And what that means is, is that when Shibuti first said like, wow, wow, like you're so eloquent. You, you must have uh, like a really high level of attainment, really high level of achievement. And she says, no, I'm so eloquent because I have attained nothing. Shibuti, Shibuti does this really lame move where he's like, oh yeah, non-acquisition, non-acquisition, that's it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so he, he makes non-acquisition like a practice almost or something, right? Like makes it into something. And that's why she says that a bodhisattva's eloquence has nothing to do with acquisition or not acquiring or non-acquisition. So, and that's rather paradoxical in that way. So it, it, it's leaving you in that bodhisattva um, middle zone. So, okay. To the point, to the point, the last, the fifth, the, the young, Rahula. And if you don't know, they say it in a moment, but if you don't know, Rahula is the Buddha's child, like actual Siddhartha, Gautama, the prince, before he renounced the throne to go off to become a Buddha, he had a child named Rahula. Now, after the Buddha became enlightened, he went back to his father's palace and kind of uh, converted everybody, including his son. And so Rahula became a monk. And so the venerable Rahula said to Ashoka Dutta, your discourse isn't pure. <laughs> you wear jeweled shoes. And you sit on a high couch while discussing the Dharma with these Shravakas. Have you not heard that one should not explain the Dharma to those who are not sick while sitting on a high couch? <laughs> Thereupon, Ashoka Dutta asked Rahula, do you really know what is pure and what is impure? <laughs> You want to know what's pure and impure, Rahula? <laughs> right? <laughs> Rahula, this is what she says. You want to know what's pure and impure? Rahula, is the world impure? Or no, is the world pure? Is the world pure? Rahula replies, it is neither pure nor impure, Ashoka Dutta. Those who accept and practice the precepts, the rules set forth by the Tathagata, and then break them, they can be said to be pure or impure. But those who never break the precepts are neither pure nor impure. So there's a few things going on here, right? So she, she says... <laughs> Basta, basta. She says, stop, stop, enough. Don't, do not say so, right? She says, those who practice the Dharma as taught and the precepts as set forth, those can be said to be impure, whether they later break them or not. 
So I'm not. I'm going to have to do the thing where I truncate this great conversation about the rules. Um, Rahul is considered like the most disciplined. He he like followed the rules the best, and so this is an interesting exchange to be having. But what I want you to know. I wrote, I wrote here on my board that, 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 Rahula, that Rahula's like mind question is about purity. And he's basically saying, you're a woman, you're a girl. You, you, you can't be, you got shoes on, you're on a couch, lay person, you're impure. You can't be teaching the Dharma. <laughs> Like as great as it as great as it is, and as, as enlightened as it is, it's still impure. Um, there's a whole big thing going on here, right? Like within the world of anthropology, if you don't know Mary Douglas's book, Purity and Danger, about taboos, it's there's a lot going on here about this the long-standing perception of women as impure. That's, a, that's what's being challenged here, is that very long-standing tradition that's so prevalent in so many cultures. Mary Douglas had to get together and write an amazing anthropology book about how this is like a thing, right? And so this discourse right here is about this idea of like women being impure and a bunch of things about that. And again, I, I got, I'm going to skip the more philosophical parts of their conversation. And, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip this amazing conversation they have about where the bodhisattva sits. Do they sit on, on a grass? Do they sit on raised beds? Do they sit on threat? Like, it's a very interesting conversation about where the bodhisattva sits. And of course, that's relevant because this whole sutra has been about this 12-year-old girl sitting. She's exobia. She has been immovably sitting in her meditation posture this whole sutra. So the discourse that they have about where the bodhisattva sits, is, it's, it's very interesting. Again, I can't really get into it, but she kind of, you know, she's going off she said this whole thing and then you know basically uh, you know at the end she's like and you know what rahula yeah empty right <laughs> she's like whatever <laughs> like go away <laughs> and and <laughs> and because of that king ajata shatru says to ashoka datta do you not know that rahula is the son of shakyamuni tathagata and that he stands first in discipline? Ashoka Datta said to her royal father, Oh, please, your majesty, do not say that Rahula is the son of the Tathagata. Your majesty, have you ever seen or heard that a lion gives birth to a jackal? Never, Ashoka Datta replied. Your majesty, have you, have you ever seen or heard that a universal monarch pays homage to a minor king? Never, Ajata Shatru said, Your Majesty, when the Tathagata, like the King of Lions, turns the great Dharma wheel, all the Shravakas gather around him. Your Majesty, who are the true children of the Tathagata? As far as the true Dharma is concerned, the answer should be Bodhisattvas. Therefore, your majesty, do not say that the Tathagata has a son or doesn't have a son. If the, Tathagata has, if the Tathagata has any true child, it is one who brings forth supreme bodhicitta. When this doctrine was spoken, 20,000 ladies in the palace of King Ajata Shatru brought forth bodhicitta, 20,000 gods who were satisfied with this doctrine that, that Ashoka Datta brought, taught also brought forth bodhicitta after hearing her make this lion's roar. The king said, 
these people are the sons of past, present, and future Buddhas. How can those who study the Sharvaka precepts to free themselves from afflictions be the true children of the Tathagata? So he, he has seen the light. Ajata Shatra just saw the light. He was like, you're right. How could these, how could these fools be the, be the children of the, of the Tathagata? Thereupon, the gods scattered flowers around the Buddha and all over the city of Rajgriha as an offering to the maiden, Ashoka Datta. Then, fearless virtue stepped down from her couch and paid homage to the Shravakas. She gave them various kinds of delicious, fragrant food and drink as offerings, all according to the rules. After making offerings, she said, I do not know why you venerable Shravakas have left the Tathagata and have come here so early in the morning. You should go out to beg for food only after hearing the Dharma explained. Please go back. I shall be there in a moment. Thereupon, fearless, thereupon, Ashoka Datta, together with her royal father and mother, and surrounded by countless people of Rajgriha, went to see the Tathagata that morning. They all bowed down with their heads at the Buddha's feet and sat down to one side. The Shravakas also returned to the Buddha also bowed with their heads at the Buddha's feet and sat down to one side. Then, Venerable Shariputra said to the Buddha, World honored one, Ashoka Datta is marvelous. She has acquired many blessings and many great benefits. The Buddha told Shariputra, Ashoka Datta has long ago brought forth bodhicitta and has planted many good roots in the presence of nine billion past buddhas in order to seek the supreme enlightenment of the buddha shariputra asked world honored one could she change herself into a man So I, I, this is, okay, n n thus begins the exegesis, movement of the people. So this is, um, I've, I've written what's about, so <laughs> Shari Putra asked this question. And remember, Shari Putra's like, wow, she's marvelous. She's so amazing. Couldn't she just turn herself into a man? Like, couldn't she just be a man? That's what Shariputra said. And, and I mean, I've, I've debated about how to do this. Um, I got a little time, so I'm going to do it right. So I, I need to explain to you and read to you very care not read to you actually, I need to explain exactly what happened. So Shariputra says, can she change, excuse me, can she change herself into a man? And the Buddha says, Shariputra, do you consider her as a female? Do not take such a view. Why? What it says is, it is because of this bodhisattvas, it is because of the power of the production of her will. It is, it is because of the power of will, the willpower, like basically, of this bodhisattva 
that she now appears as a woman. For the benefit of all sentient beings. Actually, what it says is that Wei Du Zhong Sheng, in order to do Zhong, in order to do uh, sentient beings, and this this verb do do um, in the Heart Sutra, it is do yi qie ku er, overcome all suffering, to be liberated from all suffering. So what this says is, what the Chinese says, is that when Shariputra says, wow, could she turn into a man? And the Buddha says, you see, you see her as a man? Don't take that view. It is because of this Bodhisattva's great will that she appears to you, that, is, that she appears in a female body in order to save, <laughs> liberate, sentient beings. That's what it says. Thereupon, Ashoka Datta made this declaration. She says, if all, dharm, if all dharmas are neither male nor female, if all dharmas neither male nor female, then right now I will manifest myself <laughs> into the body of a Purusha. Okay, L let me, yeah, I need to explain what, what's going on here. What I just read in terms of the Chinese, and by the way, we only have a Chinese version of this, unfortunately. We don't have a city to refer to, so we only have what we have. But what we have, in my opinion, is very, very clear. <laughs> the trickiest part about this section is this term in Chinese, it's called a zhang, uh, a zhang fu. A Zhang Fu. And what's really tricky about language, woo -wee, what's tricky about language is, is that this Chinese expression, a Zhang Fu, has a lot of meanings. It, it means something today. Like if I were to just drop down into Chinatown, USA, and say this term Zhang Fu, it would mean one thing. Throughout history, it would mean, uh, th throughout Chinese history, it means many other things. And in a Buddhist text, it means something else, which is a purusha, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Which, and that is an Indian idea, which in India means all kinds of other things. But I'll tell you what, what this doesn't say is that she turned herself into a man. It's not what it says, despite the fact. So now I'm going to, I'm going to, um, you know, I need, I need to do a proper exegesis here. I want to share with you now how this works, <laughs> how, you know, this, the, you know, I joked earlier that we were going to sort of start to, or try to dismantle the patriarchy. This stuff is very subtle, you know, because, you know, this, this guy and his committee, I don't know, you know, you know these agendas and ideas, they're very subtle, but I just want you to read, I just want you to hear how they translated this. Shariputra asked, world honored one, can she change herself into a man? The Buddha said, Shariputra, do you consider her as female? Do not take such a view. Why? Because it is by virtue of his vow that this bodhisattva reveals himself in a female form to win sentient beings over to the Dharma. I don't know why they're referring to Ashoka Datta as him. There's a 
reason. Now, in terms of what's about to happen, in terms of what's about to happen, that she's about to transform herself in a minute, maybe we could talk about it, but there is no reason why to add all of these he's and undercut the message of this suture, which is that this young <laughs> the girl has, with great eloquence, schooled all of these disciples and then even the buddha is like yeah she's really something else and then when shariputra has this dumbass ridiculous idea about wouldn't it be cool if she were a man the buddha says don't why don't think like that it's and it says it's because of her it's because of her her great vow that she appears like this Again, there's no reason to, like, a default mode, default mode. Like, there's no reason to default mode into any he here, first of all. Thereupon, fearless virtue, virtue sorry, the, the text says, that, uh, thereupon Ashoka Datu, Adatta, made this declaration. If no dharma is masculine or feminine, then may I now change into a man in full view of the people here. That's what it says. May I turn into a man to make, you know, to make sure I put her happy or whatever. She turns herself into Purusha. Okay. First of all, let's, so let's start with that. I could really start to dismantle the term Jiang Fu. Yes, Jiang Fu in modern Mandarin means husband. It does mean husband in modern Mandarin. It did not mean that in medieval China. It didn't even mean it. It, it. it only recently has come to mean husband. The actual characters have more to do with uh, um, teacher, elder, senior, disciplinarian, um, things along those lines. So even if we're going with strictly the Chinese Zhang Fu, what a Zhang Fu is in a, in, um, if you actually, um, sorry folks, if you actually look up, if you actually look up the term Zhang Fu, it is a, a, a um, in the Buddhist context, it is a virile disciple, a very like um, uh, zealous disciple is what it means actually and there is there's even though culturally even though culturally the jiang fu tends to be male it the jiang fu doesn't need to be male if if the text wanted to say that she turned herself into a man it could have said that and it didn't say that now again if you start go digging deeper and you start to really look into what a Zhang Fu is in a Buddhist text, it is the way that the Chinese Buddhists translated the Indian cosmological idea of Purusha, mankind, <laughs> like mankind in, in like the singular. And the idea is, is that in order to demonstrate to all of these people, she turned, in fact, she made a declaration and she said, if all dharmas are neither male nor female, then right now I will manifest into a great being, into a very great being, and thereupon, right? Immediately after she said that, her female body changed not into a male one, into Purusha, right? And then, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, she ascended into midair to a height of seven palm trees, one above the other and stayed there. Then, 
the world honored one asked venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, do you see Bodhisattva Ashoka Datta staying in midair? Shariputra answered, yes, I do, world honored one. The Buddha said, Shariputra, Bodhisattva Ashoka Datta will attain supreme possible after 7,000 myriad of kalpas and will be named Vimala, undefiled Tathagata, the worthy one, the all-knowing one. That Buddha's world will be called Prabhasa, bright, and her lifespan will be 100 kalpas. The true Dharma will prevail, will prevail in that world for 10 kalpas with an assembly of 30,000 monastic bodhisattvas, all of whom have reached the stage of non-regression. The ground of that world will be made of clear lapis lazuli and adorned by eight rows of magnificent lotus flowers. The names of the miserable planes of existence will not even be known there. That world will be full of gods. Shariputra, those gods will enjoy wonderful pleasures and the flavor of the supreme dharma, as do the gods in the Toshita heaven. Okay. Everybody good? Um, I pretty much said everything that I wanted to say about that very important message. Again, it's very unfortunate that the way that this reads, it's very unfortunate that in the text here it reads, Shariputra th says, wow, couldn't she turn herself into a man? And then she does. And it's not even like, it's just a man. It's just a guy. It's like so unfortunate that not, not only did they mess with the grammar, not only did they mess with it to take away like her position, but then they even just like, they didn't even let her become Purusha. It was like, yeah, it just became a guy, right? Whereas, frankly, the, the, if, I if I understand the theatrics, right, if I'm staging, can I, can I talk staging for a minute? If I understand the staging of this Dharma attainment, right, she was down here and they were all up here like, why aren't you standing up? And they were all looking down on her. Her father was looking down on her. The Shravakas were looking down on her. Is it just me or are they all now to the height of seven palm trees stacked one on top of another? Are they not all looking up to her? Wow, now that's, that's a Dharma message. That's a Dharma message, especially regarding this one that this all happened because she said, if all dharmas, if all phenomena are neither male nor female, that's where it all happened, right? Uh, just let me just, uh, I'll just finish this up. We just have a little, little bit more of, of beautifulness. Thereupon, Bodhisattva Ashoka Datta's mother, the queen, whose name was Moonlight. Moonlight. Who had come to see the Buddha with King Ajatashatru. And after the Buddha had spoken, she said to him with her palms joined together, World honored one, I have gained great benefit. I was pregnant with this child for nine months. And now this good child makes the lions roar. I now dedicate my good roots to the attainment of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. 
so that I may attain supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment in that world bright of the Tathagata Vimala, undefiled in the future. Thereupon, the Buddha asked Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, do you see this woman now? The queen? Shariputra replies, yes, I do. The Buddha said, Shariputra, this woman, moonlight, will be reborn in the heaven of the 33 heavens after death and will be named intense light. When Bodhisattva Maitreya attains Bodhi, that god intense light will be the eldest, most prominent son of King Other View. After that prince makes offerings to Maitreya Buddha, he will renounce the household life. He will be able to remember and practice the Dharma taught by Maitreya Buddha from beginning to end. And he will see all the Buddhas of the worthy Kalpa and make offerings to them one by one. Then, when Bodhisattva Ashoka Datta attains supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment and becomes the undefiled Tathagata Vimala, the god, intense light, will be an emperor possessing the seven treasurers named Holder of the Earth. And after that emperor makes offerings to all the Tathagatas, he will also attain supreme unsurpassable enlightenment and be named Universal Light Tathagata, the Worthy One, the All-Knowing One. He will establish a Buddha land exactly like that mentioned before. Upon hearing this, Queen Moonlight was overwhelmed with joy. She took off her exquisite necklace of precious stones, which cost hundreds of thousands of pounds of gold, and offered it to the Buddha. And then she received the 500 precepts of a nun and began to lead the pure life. Then Bodhisattva Shokadatta said to the Tathagata, May all Bodhisattvas, by virtue of my vow, be reborn by transformation, wearing monastic robes when I attain Bodhi in the future. May the Tathagata, because of my vow, now give me the appearance of a young monk ordained for eight years. Immediately after Bodhisattva Shokadatta uttered these words, she changed into a monk dressed in a monastic robe. Then Bodhisattva Shokadatta suddenly changed back to her original appearance and said to her father, King Ajatashatru, Your Majesty, all dharmas are like this. They are apart from the forms caused by all discriminations, and they defy all misconceptions. Now, your majesty, I have revealed myself again in the form of a maiden. Does your majesty see me? The king answered, yes, I do, but I do not know how to see you as you physically appear because I just saw you as a monk before seeing you now as a maiden again. The Buddha said to King Ajatashatru, your majesty, which form is the true one? You should learn to abide by right view regarding all dharmas. Sentient beings are burning with afflictions because they do not understand the power of the Dharma. Not understanding the power of the Dharma, they doubt what should not be doubted. Therefore, you should often keep close to the Tathagata and to the youthful Bodhisattva Manjushri because the awe-inspiring power of that Bodhisattva's virtue will enable your majesty to repent for your misdeeds. Then the Buddha told Ananda, 
You should accept and practice this Dharma door of the prophecy of Bodhisattva Ashoka Datta's attainment of Buddhahood. Read and recite it and do not forget it. Ananda, a good man or a good woman, may give to the Buddhas enough of the seven treasures to fill a billionfold world universe. However, another person will surpass that person in blessings if they can accept and practice even one sentence or stanza of this Dharma door of the prophecy of Bodhisattva Ashokadatta's attainment of Buddhahood after hearing it explained. Not to mention those who read and recite the entire sutra, explain it widely to others, and practice it as taught. When the Tathagata had spoken this Dharma door of the prophecy of Bodhisattva Ashokadatta's attainment of Buddhahood, Queen Moonlight, Ashokadatta's mother, and all the gods, dragons, and asuras, and so forth were jubilant over the Buddha's teaching, and they accepted it with faith and began to practice it with veneration. Ta-da! So that is the beautiful Ashoka Data Sutra. Any thoughts, comments, ideas? Hey, Michael. Hey, Noe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is the what was the other one we studied? Uh, something Dana, the Mira Dana. What was it? Almost. Good. Good looking out, Noe. So this is Sutra 32. The next Sutra, Sutra 33, which is translated in this collection as uh, a discourse on ready eloquence. I mentioned that earlier. That's, so this one mentioned this concept of ready eloquence. But the actual Chinese and, and therefore, and the Sanskrit title of it is Vimaladatta. So also Datta, also a young woman, also battling Shravakas, but her name is Vimala Datta. But wait a minute, Vimala is the name of this Tathagata's, this Tathagata in this lapis lazuli world called Brilliant. So there is certainly some weaving, you know, indeed a brocade, of of uh, of jewels here. I hey Michael, I have oh go oh, yeah please. I was just real quickly going to ask if there's a numerical or what the numerical significance is of the seven palm trees. Oh, the seven. You know, it's funny that is a a trope or it's a you see it in sutras that somebody basically gets enlightened or something and they rise to the height of seven palm trees. I do not know if anybody in the audience knows, please. Um, I'm sure there is a significance to the seven. I could take random guesses, but if only if I knew, yeah. And actually on the note of the palm trees, I wanted you to know there's also an, an unfortunate like, uh, gloss, as it were, when she rises to the height of seven palm trees, one above the other, the, the English, sadly, it says, um, she ascended in midair to a height of seven palm trees, one above the other, and stayed there. <laughs> it says, and, and stayed there. The, this is why I'm here, folks. I really, I want to share the really beautifulnesses of, of, you know, the language here. So what it says is, is that there's this, um, I'm going to get a marker. I got to show you. It says that she, she, her, she. So it's this beautiful sentence where it says that she ju er bu xia. And this verb, 
jewel is to abide, to rest. It is the Buddhist, the Chinese Buddhist verb for like, I mean, kind of meditating, but a deeper one. It's like abiding. To re this whole sutra has been about this verb. <laughs> This, this is, it's, the, when it's talking about her not standing up and sitting, it's been about this verb. And so when she reaches the height of that, it says that she jewel, but didn't xia, she didn't come down. It, it's, it's an echo, pardon, the, pardon that one, but it's a refrain of her not getting down from her couch. She's still not getting up in a way. It's like this, it's, if you, if this idea of like, and stayed there and stayed there, it like completely misses this beautiful meditative idea that she's risen to this abode and is not coming down. Right. So it's like just the, the, the message or the refrain, refrain of the sutra just gets repeated again. It's so beautiful. And on her, on her getting up, on her getting up to greet the shravakas right if if you didn't if you didn't pick up on the beauty the, the beautiful thing i i kind of tried to illustrate it here where their little bowls got filled with all kinds of goodies like all kinds of unexpected goodies right they, they like they're kind of like whoa where where did all this great stuff come from right well that that whole little subtle discourse there where she's like what are you guys doing here don't you know you're supposed to only go begging for food after you've heard the dharma right well you know again if we take all of this allegorically and and we don't think there was a historical moment where these 10 monks went to ajatashatru's kingdom or whatever if we take it allegorically right then when she gets down from her couch and gives them all the the goodies for their bowl that's a poetic way of talking about what just happened she she just gave them so many dharma nuggets of joy and wisdom she filled their bowls with unexpected surprises they thought they might get a, a chicken leg they, th they thought they might get a chicken leg. And, I, and I'm, I'm not kidding because, of course, the early Shravakas, they ate meat. They ate food as, you know, if it was given to them. And sometimes they were known for going to rich people's houses to try to get the good stuff. So, again, I start in, you know, the first lesson or the first night of this, I mentioned that there was going to be a lot of subtle uh, discourse going on about giving receiving gifts what's being given to whom and so that is sort of um well again it's a beautiful moment where after all of that she still gets up you know and and pays respect in that way any other questions ideas comments Michael, yeah, um, I kept thinking about uh, the the shiny shoes, and I and I know you brought it back, but I did I miss what that was about? Because you you were like, there's something there. Remind me so that good looking out. <clears throat> I teased I teased that one the whole time, and I didn't uh, do it. You know, like all of this. Um, there's a lot of interpretation going on, right? On my, on my part, indeed, even exegesis, where I'm trying to really get this correct, right? The way that I understand where that falls in the text, which is the discourse with Rahula about purity, it's my understanding that it's about wealth. And the reason I say that it is, is the, the flip of that. The flip side of it is the, the shravaka or the monk that has, is barefoot. No shoes, a sign of poverty. 
and it's a basically an idea of course that are traditionally these are the only ones that can teach the dharma they're pure worthy of that and a sign of that poverty is again no shoes so because she has these jeweled shoes and rahula says you can't teach the dharma you have jeweled shoes i think it's about wealth class type of a thing and basically saying that just because i'm you know, of a wealthy family, or again, just because I'm female, wealthy family, doesn't mean my wisdom is less wise than your wisdom. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like this deep flip, right? From the monks, male, uh, pure, poor, taking these vows to female, wealthy. It's like, how could you possibly presume to to bring the Dharma, say, say they, right, you know, and then she, she, she drops it. Yeah, yeah, and then she, yeah, right on. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, questions, comments, ideas? I did also want to note really quickly, there was a point in the discourse with uh, Shibuti, uh, it's a point I want to reiterate because it's sort of a, a very important, actually to what, to what we just talked about with the shoes. Um, it's where Ashoka Datta says to Shibuti about the eloquence, where she says, a bodhisattva's eloquence has nothing to do with acquisition or non-acquisition, with learning or not learning, R renouncing household life or not renouncing it. And why? Because a bodhisattva's wisdom comes from purity of mind. And along with that wisdom, eloquence appears. So that's like, that's a line that is a very important line that appears in many of these sutras, which is this line that renunciation, <laughs> renunciation is giving up delusion. That's renunciation. Not necessarily the grand renunciation of house, hair, family, all of that. That line, it has nothing to do with attainments, non-attainments, nothing to do with learning or not learning. Again, the presumption here being that these monks are learned and that she is sort of not learned. That's sort of the idea. And so this, this, uh, this idea doesn't have anything to do with learned, not learned, renouncing the household life or not renouncing it. And because I meant to say it a few nights ago, maybe even the first night, there is a, f a very famous Zen Buddhist text. Um, it's sort of uh, outside of sutras, it's one of the most famous texts in the Zen tradition. This is the Platform Sutra, or the Sutra of Hui Nang, the Sixth Patriarch. And I just mention it because a lot, you know, a lot of people are familiar with that text. And so I just want to do a, a quick kind of uh, a repeat of that message I just read, but sort of comparing it to that text. So that's a that's a fun sutra. That's a fun text because it's about this guy Hui Nang. Hui Nang's illiterate. He's from the South and traditionally China is very much like the United States that way where Northerners have a very low opinion of Southerners. That there's that type of Northern Southern bias like in the States, same in China. And Huinang is from the South, uh, like South of the border kind of an idea. And he's illiterate and all of these other things. So very low class. But he managed to hear some Dharma and it clicked and he became basically enlightened. And so he goes charging up to the north, charging up to the, the Zen, like the Zen monastery. And when he tries to get into the monastery, they, they stop him at the door and they say, no, 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 no. You can't come in here. You're from the south. And the, the line of the sutra is nothing good can come from the south. 
And Huenang says, although I may come from the south and you be, may come from the north, as far as I understand the teachings of the Buddha, as far as I understand the Dharma, there's no difference in our Buddha nature. There's no difference in our nature. And it's actually that that, oh, they're like, oh, sorry, we, did, we didn't realize. And, and they, they let him into the monastery. Well, I think this is even cooler. I think this is an even more powerful message than that, in a way. For a few reasons. One, it's the full gambit. It's not just north-south. It's not just male-female. It's not just age. It's, you know, it's all the whole gambit in this one. And this is a sutra. This is what's called Buddha Vacha, right? This is the words of the Buddha. And I'm not, I don't want to get into a debate about Theravada, Mahayana, and like all of that stuff. What a, a better, and, and actually this is sort of the point that I wanted to kind of conclude on. All of these sutras that I work with, these kind of Chinese sutras, right? They come from this large, very large Chinese Buddhist canon. It's all of the sutras, thousands and thousands of them. Um, as, I've, as I've told many people, you know, a fraction of these have been translated into English, right? So it's a bunch, a bunch of sutras. And the Chinese, the Chinese were pretty notorious for weeding out Apocrypha. They were very notorious for, if, if they didn't like what something said, it was out. And, and there's, I've got a number of books over here in the library that are about other sutras that are very interesting, but they got deemed apocrypha and then they became heretical texts and they weren't allowed, they weren't allowed in the canon, all of this stuff. N knowing that, it's very interesting that this one, Ashoka Datta, made the cut. <laughs> This is, the, this is the words of the Buddha, uh, official. And the Buddha says, all dharmas are neither male nor female. That those are characteristics and qualities. And if you're discriminating people based on characteristics and qualities, you're losing, you're losing. You're losing. So I <laughs> just wanted to let you know that. Um, that's... The, that's the idea of this sutra and we did it folks and i hope you i hope you're winning is is hi Cole. thank you michael My, michael what you know I, I, on the remix mc no. owens it's like Paul Simon, diamonds on the soles of her shoes. I don't know. There might be something oh. in there. I don't know. I, I can't get there uh -oh. quick enough. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, peace, bro. <laughs> Grand eloquence. Grand eloquence. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Oh, I, think my I, I can probably speak for all of us when I say I enjoyed that more than I would have enjoyed a chicken leg. So <laughs> much preferable. <laughs> Thank you very much. And to the group there, I just put a bunch of links in the chat um, for you guys to, you all to check out. Um, there are two links in there where if you want to offer Donna to the collective, you can follow those links at the top. Um, some of you may know that we have chosen to liberate ourselves from our commercial lease while uh, we're not allowed to assemble in person. And because we've been able to do that, um, I just want to let you all know that what we're doing is we're passing along more of the Donna to our teachers. Um, we're still making sure that we have enough collectively that we can be in a physical space when it's time to do that, but we're also taking this opportunity to pass more along to our teachers. So just so you know that. 
this Saturday, we have our monthly climate action uh, sit. And this particular Saturday is called the climate of now and is going to attempt to grapple with everything that's going on. Um, there's going to be an open mic and an opportunity for sharing. Um, so if you're at all interested in that, check that out. That's this Saturday on the same Zoom link. And there's a link in the chat to subscribe to our newsletter, which if you're not subscribed, you probably want to do. Um, we're starting to think ahead about new classes uh, to offer, and there are a few really exciting things coming up, and the people who are on the newsletter hear about those first. Um, so sign up. And I look forward to seeing you all back here next week. Thank you all, and thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Everybody has a great night. Thank you, Michael. Thanks.